grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's Word for our special consideration this day is our Gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. Amen, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen, I tell you again, if two of you on earth agree to ask for anything, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. In fact, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, in certain cities, an ornamental key, the key to the city is is ceremonially presented to a a resident or a visitor or or some kind of a celebrity that that city wants to particularly honor. The practice comes from a tradition called the freedom of the city back in medieval ages when cities were walled with a gate and that gate would be left open and guarded during the day but it would be closed and locked during the night. So if you gave someone the key to the city, the freedom of the city, that person could go in or come out at his own discretion as an honored guest of the city and really as a trusted friend of that place. Now with our modern cities not really having a wall all the way around and a gate that we can lock to keep people out at night, you realize that presenting someone with the key to the city is kind of a ceremonial honor. It's just, uh, well, the city of Detroit in 1980 gave the key to their city to Saddam Hussein, of all people. So actually it has very little meaning. Beverly Hills bestowed its key to the city upon the Kardashian-Jenner family. And its next-door neighbor, West Hollywood, has only bequeathed the key to her fair city to Stormy Daniels and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Probably the most generous city and giving up its key to just anyone would be San Francisco. They have given the key dozens and dozens of times over the years to baseball players, basketball players, even to the guy who invented the machine that mechanically inserts a stick into a lollipop back in 1916. And in the city of Stockton, the mayor, Mayor Avila, just a few years ago, he gave the key to his city to God. I'm not sure who received it on his behalf or if God gave it back after said mayor was arrested and convicted three times in the next three years after that event. So I don't think that I'm really going out on a limb to say that often the giving of the key is, well, it's of little significance. And yet, the keys that our Lord talks about here in His Holy Word today, it would be impossible to overstate their significance. As He gives us, He presents to us the keys that are the most important keys we could ever have or even that we've ever even heard of or known about. He's presenting us the very keys that unlock what He calls the kingdom of His heaven. We first hear about these special keys just a few chapters earlier when Peter was given that that faith to be able to give the right answer to that question about who Jesus really is. And then Christ Jesus responded to this, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then so absolutely no one could get confused and think that somehow this was just for the disciple Peter. Jesus, after finishing his work of carrying out the world's salvation, after finishing his suffering and dying for everyone's sins and and proving that restoration with God Almighty, the Holy God, by his rising from the dead, 
He repeated the whole thing. With all the disciples there, and not just the disciples, Luke tells us that the other believers were in the room as well as he says in John 20, peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever, whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. And whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So what does that mean? As we apparently good Lutherans, that's what we're supposed to always be asking, right? Well, I'm glad you asked because Martin Luther happens to very elegantly summarize that in his small catechism by saying that the power of the keys, the use and keys, the use of the keys is the power and right that Christ gave his church on earth to forgive the sins of penitent people and to refuse forgiveness to the impenitent as long as they do not repent. Which is exactly what Jesus is telling us about in this gospel reading, this part of his word that we're looking at this morning. Where the part right before it, the part we heard last time, remember Jesus was telling us that there is absolutely nothing in this world that is even, can even begin to be as important as the fate of your eternal soul. That whole thing about giving up life, to, to get the real life, to, to give up that me-serving life, to, to have the real life that only Jesus offers, even if it means carrying a cross. Even if it might mean carrying the cross that, that I have to give up the vast wealth and riches and fame and fortune and easy life that I would get by going every Sunday to the soccer tournaments or the little league tournaments because of course my son is going to be a world famous professional athlete and we're all going to, to prosper from that. That I could give up that life to be supported and fed by the word of God to honor, respect God and, and show it with my life. Or that I could, could bear the cross of, of giving up the, the, the comfortable society that I have around me of my peers and the, and the, the lack of, of, of being looked down on by them instead of making a statement about who I am in Christ and more importantly who Christ is for me and for them and, and what difference that makes in my life. As the inspired psalmist writes, man, though he has riches, does not even spend a night here. Or as Jesus puts it, after all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? What can a person give in exchange for his soul? Because we know of this way, this, this way of the cross that, that Jesus calls his, his followers on that that has this cross, His cross, that's already completely cleaned our slates of all our guilt and all our sin and made us right and righteous in the eyes of a holy God and, and secured our reservation for mansions in His eternal heavenly home. And now our Good Shepherd, and that's the actual picture that kind of dominates this part of this chapter, he continues the conversation. So, if your brother sins against you, Go and show him his sin just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. Right, nothing is more important than what happens to your soul. And that means that nothing is more important than what happens to everybody else's souls too. The one who loves you so, the one who cares for you so, wants you to love and care for others. Especially as he tells us in the very last chapter of Galatians that we were reading earlier this morning. To especially those who belong to the household of faith. So of course, then that's what we want to do, right? But how? Well, here, here's how. And notice he's talking about a believer. Not saying that the church's job is to get out there and tell the world where they're wrong and where they're sinful and where they're filthy. On the... No, he's talking about a believer here, a brother or sister in Christ. And if that person sins, and, and hear that little phrase, against us or against you, it's not that this is just a personal offense against us. This is a preposition that, that means it's anything referring to you or anything that has to do with you, anything concerning you. And that means that you know about it firsthand. So if there is a fellow believer and you know about their sin firsthand, and again, first and foremost, every sin is going to be against the Lord, but then also against his holy people, 
who want to honor and respect and love him. So even if it doesn't harm you directly, you know about it, it concerns you. It's as if that person is asking you to make a decision between them and, and God. And that is a sin against you if you need to have it that literally. And so Jesus says, then go. Don't ignore it. Don't put it off for later. Don't hope that it goes away. Don't say, well, you know, I really shouldn't get involved here. Or, or I know, I'll go ask some people's advice before I go and talk to this person about it. No, if we're to take our Lord's commands seriously, and if we're to take seriously the soul-destroying nature of sin, then we'll be wanting to go. Because that's what, that's what love does. If you want a perfect example of that, think of God. That's what he did for you. Went to that extreme to go and show you your sin, your sinfulness that would have left you condemned forever. He points out that sin, and then he points out his only remedy. And that's why Jesus, the most loving, our loving Savior, went to that extreme of, of going through all he went to to seek and to save what was lost. And that's why Jesus' people that his own word says that they have in themselves the mind of Christ Jesus. That's, that's why they want to go and, and see it as their loving responsibility to go and try to save that person who has wandered off in his or her sins. And notice, first of all, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody else. Not tell the pastor first. Not, well, I need some, some help and guidance on this first. No, it's one-on-one. -on -one. So I guess the only proper response we as God's people would have if someone comes up to us and tells us about someone else's sin, we would have to say, well, have you talked to him yet? Have you talked to her about that? In keeping with God's eighth commandment that protects the, the good name, the reputation of a person, we're going to, to keep this in strictest confidence. And for how long? As long as it takes until that person refuses to listen as patiently and as, as, as lovingly as possible to, to go until, until, yeah, if you can't anymore, if that person refuses to listen, then, then the next step, the next step to take one or two other people along. And how long would that step? Well, it sounds like there's three steps here. No, 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 there's three different phases, but this isn't one, two, three, bam, done. Because remember the purpose here, to getting that person back. Even if we have to go to that ultimate step, the, the last step, to tell the church, and that one's refusing, and it would be that ultimate attempt at a wake-up call that we sometimes call excommunication. Even still there, that's the final attempt in love of the congregation to say to that person, hey, we love you so much, we have to tell you that separating yourself from the church is separating yourself from salvation and forgiveness and eternal life that, that Jesus died to make your very own. But again, each step for us is, is, is for as long as there's a chance to discuss it. Patiently, lovingly as possible. Again, there's, there's, there's three steps, but this isn't a one, two, three, and done process. Remember the intent. It's about, it's not about getting rid of the dead wood, cleaning up those membership lists, because we don't like, you know, on the books, it's kind of messy with, you know, this person not coming sometimes, and we'd like to get that cleaned up, wouldn't we? Or... You know, there is a district assessment. We actually have to pay for that person every year to the district for that person who's on our membership list but doesn't do anything to support. No, it's not about any of those things. Although I have heard of churches before that have a set of three letters already filled out, already pre-signed, one by the pastor, one by the elders, and one by the entire church council that they can send out on, it's scheduled by the calendar on so, so many misses or so many of whatever, but they're missing the whole point of what we call church discipline. The whole point is to restore, to get the wanderer to come back. It's not about getting rid of someone. It's about regaining someone, winning them back. We could say saving them. And don't worry, we can talk like that because God does talk like that. Of course, we always want to be careful how, how we say things. We don't want false doctrine and false teaching because we know that every false doctrine is sinful and that all false doctrine and false teaching can be harmful to people's souls. But we don't have to be afraid of saying what God himself says in his word. I know sometimes people like to use as an excuse for their wrong ideas about 
the sacraments, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, or even about God's Word. No, no, no. And it sounds pious. Only Jesus can save. Only God can forgive sins. And, and right, only Jesus who lived a perfect life in the place of every single human being ever. Only Jesus who was the only one as the God-man who, who kept that perfect righteousness required by a holy God. Only that Jesus who took the pain and the shame and the suffering and the hell and the death only that Jesus could make it so that our sins are washed away, so that God could look at us and see us as perfectly holy as he sees his one and only son, that, that Jesus did that for everyone. But the way this perfectly right and holy and true God has decided and told us, the way he has chosen to make that universal Forgiveness that Jesus won for everyone, how he has made it so it could apply to each personal individually is through instruments, tools, means. The means of the gospel that he says the gospel is the power of God for saving. Through baptism, which he says baptism is the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, in 1 Peter 3, he specifically says baptism that now saves you. And that body and blood given together with the bread and wine in the, in the Holy Supper, that is for the forgiveness of sins. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And that same gospel word of forgiveness the gospel power of God for salvation, that good news, that gospel, it's not just the offer or the announcement of saving grace. It's actually the means of application of that saving grace. It's how he gets that forgiveness, that salvation, that eternal life into people, how he gets it to be our very own. So yes, sometimes after the confession in the church service, the, the pastor will say, God has forgiven all your sins like I did this morning with the service of the word. Or sometimes the pastor could say, God our Heavenly Father has been merciful, given His only Son, therefore is a called servant. I forgive you your sins. Like we do in the word of service and sacrament. And it's not just the pastor. It's any believers that have this amazing power. Not that it's something in us or something that we're doing. It's just that we're using God's powerful word that does this. This, 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 this powerful word that tells this amazing gift of sins forgiven. This powerful word that, yeah, has a word of law that says, your sins, if you stay in them, you're refusing God's forgiveness that Jesus won for everyone. This amazing word that says to those repentant sinners, those who recognize their sin and their sinfulness and, and believe in Jesus as their Savior, it's that wonderful promise of all God's blessings and eternal life forever. It's Jesus' promise to all repentant sinners, to all believers, all who recognize this. And, and He promises to back it up as we use these things that He calls the keys. Wow. Wow. What an honor. What a privilege. You have this, this something so amazing, something so incredibly special in these keys. And it's, this, is, this is not some kind of an honorary title. These keys are not just for decoration. Use them. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We now have the opportunity to confess the Christian faith our God has given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as you're able? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 